Good afternoon. We appreciate, and I know um, I speak on behalf of Marion as well, that we appreciate that everyone uh, continues to pay attention and, and we want to keep you as updated as possible about COVID-19 and the situation uh, here in Prince Edward Island. There are no new cases of COVID-19 to announce uh, for Prince Edward Island today. We've received 118 negative test results, new from yesterday. And when we look across the country, there are over 30,000 cases of COVID-19 and close to 1,200 deaths, putting our case fatality rate around 4%, which is lower than the global case fatality rate of 6.9%. So we continue to have in PEI the total of 26 cases, 23 who are considered recovered. As we head into another weekend, I'd like to remind Islanders that what we have all been doing has made a difference, but it is important that we continue to follow the public health measures. It is still important to Stay home as much as possible. And if you're heading out for an essential reason, practice physical distancing. Self-isolate if you have traveled outside the province. And for essential workers who are traveling to our province, such as, uh, and I've mentioned uh, the truck drivers um, before as essential workers, but essential workers, including truck drivers, means that when you're here in Prince Edward Island, you self-isolate when you are not at work. Of course, all the, the things we talk about, all, it feels like all the time, continue to be important about hand washing and practicing good cough etiquette. And if you're experiencing any symptoms related to COVID-19, contact your family physician, nurse practitioner, or call 811 and we can uh, arrange to have you tested for COVID-19. We recognize that these are challenging times for all of us. We are staying away from people we love. We are staying away from things we love to do. But I'm also concerned about the increase of alcohol and drug use and other risky behaviors in our province. It's important that we look after each other's mental health and, and uh, our own mental uh, health and our physical health, and we look after each other's. Our alcohol use, drug use, and other risky behaviors influence our health outcomes, not just in the short term, but over the long term as well. I think, for instance, it's important that we follow our low risk drinking guidelines which means for women, two drinks a day, up to and no more than two drinks a day, and for men, up to and no more than three drinks a day, and no more than 10 drinks a week for women, and no more than 15 drinks a week for men. And there's certainly more information about what those low-risk drinking guidelines mean for Islanders and Canadians. And just one example of, of how important um, some of these risk uh, factors are in our overall health. And there are certainly resources through Health PI with a number of support programs available for our mental health and addiction. And we have websites available and the Island Helpline as well. And that's a 1-800-218-2880. In terms of travelers to PI, and I'd like to clarify that during the period of uh, this two-week state of emergency at this point in time, some individuals who are traveling to Prince Edward Island should call the Emergency Measures Organization and by 902-894-0385 e um, or by email publicsafety at gov.pe.ca. But there are, if you are an island resident, and permanent island residents, for instance, with a PI driver's license, essential workers, you do not need to call ahead to or make those arrangements. And certainly we would encourage people who for compassionate reasons are wanting to come to PEI or who need to come to PEI and should, please contact them so that uh, 
that can be facilitated through the EMO and then working with highway safety. EMO has received a number of inquiries since yesterday and are asking for people's patience today as they do their best to return travel. Related inquiries within 24 hours, they received a large number of calls uh, yesterday afternoon and emails. And our process here complements the border controls and screenings that are in place both in Nova Scotia and in New Brunswick. If you are calling with COVID-19 inquiries and more general inquiries, please continue to use the COVID uh, information line, which is the 1-833-533-9333 number. The screening is working well, and we pre appreciate the cooperation of everyone traveling. This coming weekend, we will not have any scheduled public health briefings planned unless there is a significant change uh, where I feel it's really important uh, that we all know uh, something that has changed and that would include receiving a number of new positive cases and I will be um, back to do a public uh, briefing at that time. Um, but we'll continue to provide updates as we always do on negative results over the weekend. Um, and that will be via advisories to the media and social media and the COVID-19 information page on the government website. Every day I, I want to thank Islanders and I want to thank them again today uh, and thank you for continuing to follow public health measures. What we are all doing is making a difference, um, but it is not over yet. And I think it's important that we're careful. Um, we need to stay the course and keep going. If we ease up on our measures too soon, we run the risk of letting COVID-19 spread and we're not there quite yet. We've talked this week about looking at what easing up in Prince Edward Island could look like. And that's easing up in our health system, uh, with businesses, and in our community. And I think there are really important uh, discussions uh, to be had. And my hope is that we can share a framework of what that could look like in the weeks ahead um, sometime next week. I know it is difficult to be physically distant from family and friends. And I know we're doing all sorts of wonderful things in finding new ways to connect. It's not only that we will get through this together, we are getting through this together and we're doing it one day at a time. And uh, as uh, my friend and colleague on the other side of the country uh, says, uh, and I couldn't say it better, be kind, be calm, and be safe, and how true this is. Thank you. Et en français, uh, bonjour, bon après-midi. Um, encore aujourd'hui, il n'y a pas de cas positifs dans notre province, mais je vous confirme qu'il y a 118 tests négatifs uh, qui sont nouveaux depuis hier. Uh, C'est toujours 23 cas rétablis et 26 cas au total. Um, au Canada, il y a plus de 30 000 cas et presque 1 200 morts. Um, hier, on a déclaré un état d'urgence et prolongé l'état d'urgence sanitaire. C'est pour nous aider pour la protection de notre province. Et l'état d'urgence ne remplace pas l'état d'urgence sanitaire. Ça va nous aider à déployer les ressources dont on a besoin pour les contrôles aux divers point d'entrée. Et durant l'état d'urgence qui, à ce moment, dure deux semaines, je veux clarifier que c'est seulement les gens qui ne sont pas des résidents permanents ou des travailleurs essentiels qui doivent appeler avant de, de, de venir à l'île du Prince-Édouard. Euh, par exemple, si vous êtes résident permanent, vous auriez un permis de conduire de l'île. Euh, et Toujours, euh, bien sûr, euh, des exceptions comme les gens qui viennent ici pour des raisons humanitaires. Euh, donc, si vous n'êtes ni résident permanent, ni travailleur essentiel ou encore vous ne faites pas partie des exceptions, contactez l'Organisation des mesures d'urgence par courriel. 
et le courriel, c'est publicsafety.gov.pe.ca et le numéro, c'est 902-894-0385. Et puis, ils ont eu beaucoup de euh, courriels et beaucoup d'appels depuis hier. Euh, ce que nous faisons est très semblable à ce qui se passe à Nouveau-Brunswick et à la Nouvelle-Écosse. Uh, nous approchons le week-end et je voudrais vous rappeler des consignes qui sont tellement importantes pour la santé et la sécurité de notre province. Um, C'est important que vous n'oubliez pas ces consignes. Restez chez vous autant que possible. Sortez juste pour les essentiels et n'oubliez pas la distance physique. Et si vous revenez de l'extérieur de la province, isolez-vous. Pour les travailleurs essentiels qui viennent à l'île comme les camionneurs, isolez-vous quand, quand vous ne travaillez pas. Et puis, euh, on a des appels, euh, alors je vais mentionner ça. Um, on ne prévoit pas de briefing cette euh, fin de semaine, à moins qu'il y ait un grand changement. Par exemple, le, si je reçois confirmation qu'il y a de nouveaux cas. Uh, et on continuera à tenir les médias, le grand public, au courant uh, des résultats de tests, de dépistage par nos avis aux médias, nos réseaux sociaux et notre site Web. Et comme chaque jour, uh, je voudrais remercier tous les insulaires pour leurs efforts continus. Uh, ce que vous faites et on fait ensemble fait vraiment une différence et nous avons encore du chemin à faire. C'est tellement important qu'on continue à respecter le, les consignes. On ne peut pas tricher la pandémie. Si on relâche trop tôt, on est à grand risque de la propagation de COVID-19. Trop court, on n'est pas encore là pour parler de relâchement aujourd'hui, mais on en parle et puis euh, j'espère en parler plus à la semaine prochaine. Je vous dis à tous les jours que nous allons passer à travers ça ensemble, mais aussi que nous le faisons euh, maintenant. On est en train de passer à travers ça et on le fait bien d'une journée à la prochaine. Merci. I thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Health PEI's response to the COVID-19 pandemic is focused on limiting the spread and impact of this disease on PEI. It's also about ensuring we have the resources needed and available to respond to any surge in patients that may come. As shown by Dr. Morrison and Premier King earlier this week, the modeling gives a broad range of possible outcomes to this pandemic. We're fortunate to have a health system on PEI that incorporates all of our services and is able to partner with our private providers as well. We're preparing for the possibility of a significant surge that could take place over the coming weeks and months. This includes securing additional resources such as protective equipment, ventilators and space for adding beds if needed. Our planning and operational teams are looking at and preparing for what possibly could be needed. One part of this plan includes ensuring we've done as much as possible to protect our islanders living in long-term care homes. We know the virus has had devastating effects on these patients and islanders ac or residents across Canada and internationally. We've implemented no, no visitor policies in all long-term care homes and have done so early with Dr. Morrison's leadership. In addition to protection, as an additional protection for these islanders, with the recent public health order it, that took effect, all healthcare staff who work in long-term care, who've traveled outside of PEI for any reason, must self-isolate for 14 days and not be at work. Within our long-term care facilities, We're implementing evidence-based guidance to limit the possibility of any outbreak. And while we hope to never have to, we also have protocols in place for the management of cases if they do occur. We're working in every way we can to protect those vulnerable islanders. Our virtual care services continue to expand with almost 100 healthcare providers now registered to take part in our video-based platform. As I previously mentioned, this will allow a secure video conference between healthcare providers and patients, providing increased access for health services while maintaining safe physical distancing. We're now 
We are now developing some public information to help patients and clients who are be able to use this service with their healthcare practitioners. And so that will help them navigate the system and uh, be able to use that well. We're working with our staff and physicians across the health system to ensure everyone knows how to use the right personal protective equipment at the right time and in the right way so that our staff and patients stay safe now and have the equipment needed to remain safe in the future. I think the modeling from this week shows how important it is that we continue to plan and conserve our supplies now while we have minimal, minimal COVID-19 patients in case of a higher rate of infection or hospitalizations in the future. It's also clear that the testing is an important part of containing the spread of the virus, and we're very happy with the additional testing capability that our labs on PEI have had that Dr. Morrison has explained over the past week. We continue to offer our cough and fever clinics as well as the drive-through testing in both Charlottetown and Summerside seven days a week, and that will continue. On Thursday, we saw 79 patients in Charlottetown and 19 at our Summerside clinics. Dr. Morrison mentioned if anyone is looking to be seen through the cough and fever clinic or to have testing with possible COVID-19 symptoms, please call 811 or your health care provider to get access to that clinic. Finally, I just want to say a thank you to uh, health care workers as essential workers, but all essential workers who are playing an important part in this pandemic response. And please ensure you're looking for ways to take care of yourselves as we continue our good work. Thank you for everyone in doing their part in responding to this emergency. Thank you. Open for questions. Happy to take them. Nicole Williams, CDC. Hi, Nicole. Hi there. Uh, my question is actually for you, Dr. Morrison, both of them. Um, so the first one is, uh, how long do we need to go without any new cases for you to feel comfortable saying we're on the other side of the curve? So I, um, I've been asked that question uh, actually a number of times today as well, and, and uh, we've been asking um, the, it even with the public health team. So I think that question really relates to my comment earlier about um, Looking at uh, the information across um, the world, uh, European Commission has uh, come out uh, with some information around uh, sort of de-escalation. We are having conversations uh, with my colleagues across the country with this on the special advisory committee, um, recognizing that different provinces are at different uh, stages of this um, outbreak, and uh, so we're trying to look at that as part of, um, so the answer to the question is really in part of how do we know when we can start to ease up and how do we do that? Um, and it is, uh, I think we'll talk more about it next week, Nicole, as we go forward. It's, it's not just um, the cases here, but um, as we ease up, do we have the criteria in place that we can measure um, uh, rise in cases quickly and be able to identify what's happening really easily. Uh, we we certainly don't want to get into a situation where we ease up uh, too quickly all at once, and then we'll never be able to really get back to this position um, that we're in um, today. So we do it in phases. So a uh, long, long answer to the question is uh, there's not a specific day at this point in time, um, but we'll certainly talk about it uh, in, uh, as part of a bigger um, framework for looking at PEI uh, uh, next week. And, and, I'm, and I am looking forward to doing that and um, hopeful that we can uh, have that uh, discussion uh, um, because we, we have not had a lot of cases in the last uh, week to 10 days. 
Thank you. And my next question is about the ferries, because earlier this week uh, you mentioned you'd be having a conversation with Nova Scotia Public Health and the Northumberland Ferries. I'm wondering uh, if you've had that discussion, and if so, what concrete measures uh, have you come up with for the ferry? Will you be turning away people on either side if they're traveling for non-essential reasons uh, and anything else you might uh, have? So I uh, spoke with um, Dr. Strang in Nova Scotia, and we had a conversation with Northumberland Ferries, uh, um, or our team did this morning as well, and I was there. Um, and it, um, I, I, so we were having discussions, and I think there'll be an announcement in the next uh, couple of days, um, and that announcement will come out of Northumberland Ferries. Uh, but we have, they've spoken with Nova Scotia, they've spoken um, with uh, myself and, the, and my team, and uh, they will be making, uh, um, f giving further uh, updates and announcement in, in the next couple of days. Thank you. You're welcome. Louise Martin, CBC. Hello, good afternoon. Hi. Actually, both my questions today are for Marion Dowling. Um, so you mentioned, and, and I know Dr. Morrison mentioned yesterday, the two weeks of isolation for long-term care workers now, and that's new this week, new as of yesterday. Do we track or do you know how many uh, long-term care workers are coming from out of province? How many are leaving the province and having to come back? Is that something that long-term care homes are, have to report to Health PEI? Hi, Louise. Um, great question. I, I don't have a number for you, and we're hoping that the impact of making this change should be very low. We would have certainly staff with the number of employees that we have within Health PEI and potentially the private long-term care homes. We would have individuals who may have needed to travel for essential reasons over the last uh, 14 days to take a family member to an appointment at a province uh, for medical reasons or, or uh, other compassionate grounds and other essential needs that they may have had. So I have not heard that since the change it has had a huge impact on anyone who would need to now follow that guidance that works within our long-term care homes. Certainly, though, we're making some plans and um, trying to limit the movement of staff or across facilities and within our homes um, as well. So some of that we're just working with the managers um, and directors of nursing and administrators for the, both the public and private long-term care homes to understand what impact that would have. Okay, so, so just to clarify, that's, that's a discussion that's happening now, and so we can maybe expect news on that in the, in the coming days? Yeah, we may. I think we're just monitoring and trying to put as many protections as we can in place while still being able to ensure that we have the appropriate levels of staffing and support for the residents who are in the homes. Okay, understood. Okay, my qu second question. Um, we know that Holland College in Charlottetown has 40 residence rooms ready as of today for healthcare workers. Uh, what is the current plan for those rooms? Who will be using them? And in do we know when they will be when they will be used? Um, yeah, there there are some parameters that our uh, Human Resource Department has been looking at and working with EMO, who's really been coordinating the efforts on getting some alternative locations for staff accommodations. If we are to have staff working within our facilities, either acute or long-term care, where we uh, have COVID-19 positive patients. Um, so they've put some parameters in place around the priority of access to that. So currently, thankfully, we have no positive cases within our long-term care homes or our acute care facilities um, or other service areas. Everyone is at home uh, that's been um, determined positive to date. So I don't have a timeline on that, but what my understanding of it is now is that that facility is ready and we have some processes in place for staff to identify themselves and have some uh, priority for those employees who would be working directly with COVID-19 positive patients uh, being able to access those rooms. And it would be for any uh, employee who's working in that environment. Appreciate your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Allison Jenkins, The Guardian. Hello, yes. Uh, my question is about um, testing in long-term care homes. Uh, how many tests have been conducted uh, in, in long-term care homes? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, do you have the answer? <laughs> um, 
Hi. I, um, I don't have the answer of how many tests have been done in long-term care homes, but I do know there have been uh, tests done, and those are the tests that are identified as super rapid that need to happen really quickly, and um, that will continue to be the case. Uh, I spoke yesterday about our local testing capacity, so the majority of those cases uh, are tests being available uh, in 24 hours, but then uh, a certain number of, t of tests that uh, can be done daily and per week that are done in uh, 50 minutes uh, when it gets to the lab. So um, tests from long-term care really would be a uh, top priority if anyone uh, develops symptoms. One of the things that we have been uh, discussing with the lab as well in terms of testing long-term care facilities is, uh, uh, and really there have been emails back and forth and discussions um, in the last uh, over this last night and this morning around uh, making sure residents are tested on admission to long-term care facilities, whether or not they have symptoms, and then repeating that testing um, and, um, and looking as we, um, in the days ahead, about uh, doing some testing of um, healthcare workers who would be, you know, a certain healthcare workers that might be um, moving from facility to facility and doing uh, um, and having discussion about how many and, and uh, how we can do that um, in, uh, appropriately. So that's an ongoing discussion and uh, but certainly uh, wanting to make sure that uh, we continue to test rapidly those who are in long-term care and um, those uh, who are on admission really. Okay, thanks. And um, this might be a repeated question uh, from another day, but how many of the super rapid tests have we been able to do in total? I understand you don't know the breakdown of seniors' homes, but um, how many have we managed to get done as we ramp up? Well, so, um, uh, and I think I said this uh, yesterday, so uh, in the last week we did, so maximum of 100 uh, local uh, tests and those local tests were okay. what we were considered rapid. And in uh, going ahead in the in the next week, we'll do uh, up to a thousand uh, tests uh, uh, here now. And some of them, uh, I would suggest that uh, having them back within 24 hours is also f very quick, especially when you look at some of the tests around the country. Um, and then um, so there may be the majority may still be within 24 hours, but uh, others uh, will be done uh, very quickly. And that would be really health care workers. Um, uh, someone who's pregnant who's going into labor uh, and who has symptoms of COVID, we'd want to make sure that they uh, get tested. Um, the long-term care um, uh, and anyone who's sick in long-term care, so those would be rapid, so even more rapid. So I, I think uh, it's really, we're in a really fortunate position and, and that capacity will just continue to increase here in PEI. Okay, great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Stu Meepy, The Guardian. Hi, Stu. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, happy Friday to you both. Uh, question for Dr. Morrison, uh, I guess about the uh, two, uh, two of the three uh, testing PCR kits that I guess Prince Edward Island is using now uh, haven't uh, been fully approved or, or they don't appear on the list of approved devices uh, from Health Canada. So I, I guess I'm wondering what that means. Does that mean that the results from these two devices, uh, you know, the positive and negative, still need to sort of be confirmed by labs off island, or you know, how does that work? Um, well, the actually the testing machines and um, kits have all been approved by Health Canada, so there maybe it's just not. Um on the website because they did uh, get approval just before um, we got them here. Um, the We are uh, sending for confirmation um, all our tests uh, do eventually go to uh, the National Microbiology Lab um, at this point in time and that's uh, making sure that uh, everything continues to be validated which was uh, the same for other provinces uh, uh, for a period of time and uh, and uh, eventually then uh, we, we will not have to do that. But uh, uh, I know that same thing, uh, same process took uh, place in Halifax 
Cheyenne in New Brunswick, and um, uh, and that is the expectation here. So uh, we're not uh, using anything that is not approved uh, by Health Canada. Okay. Um, I guess does that mean that um, I guess there is some sort of uh, I think it's called a special uh, special approval process that the island went through for for I guess those kits. I'm just sort of wondering why they don't seem to appear I guess on the, the list of approved devices. Uh, I mean, I can follow up, certainly, and uh, we can um, have the lab follow up with you, Stu. Um, as far as I'm aware, we didn't go through any particular uh, special process, but uh, I can confirm that with the lab. Uh, but um, these are uh, approved uh, in the province. Or it, they're approved by Health Canada, and we're using them here. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Carrie Wynn McLeod, Ocean 100. Hi, Carrie Wynn. Carrie Wynn McLeod. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, my first question is for Dr. Morrison. Just uh, talking about the temporary foreign workers and that they will be all self-isolating uh, together upon arrival for 14 days in one uh, scheduled spot. I'm just wondering, is there a plan in place or what would happen then? Should one of the um, essential work, one of these essential workers contract COVID-19 as to, you know, where would they go then? Um, are all of the others that were self-isolating with them tested right away or only if they become symptomatic? Okay. Um, hi, Carrie Wynn. So the, if... Um when the temporary foreign workers are here, they're and self-isolating. They're actually in uh, their own individual um, rooms, and um, they will be treated like any other islander who gets symptoms. They will be tested, um, and then any close contacts uh, identified um, up to, and that would include asymptomatic close contacts 48 hours uh, prior to them developing symptoms. And um, and then if they are well enough to stay at home, which most of our cases uh, to date have been uh, well enough to stay uh, um, at home, uh, they will continue to do that with the daily uh, supports um, that uh, all our cases uh, would get here in PEI. And um, if they develop more symptoms, they will get care like any, any other uh, uh, person in, in Prince Edward Island. Well, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, my second question is also about um, the lobster industry. Now, we've seen reports from different uh, associations right around uh, uh, the Maritime and what they are thinking about what they would like to request from the federal government. Um, here at home, the PEI Fishermen's Association, um, you know, says that the federal minister has pretty much said it will be a go, but if they want to do a, a delay on that, they need to make a formal request, but they don't want to make a formal request until they, they uh, see or learn about what the um, protocols or the safeguards that will be put in place for the fishers and uh, those in the um, processing plants as well. Um, I'm just wondering, when would those protocols be be made, uh, Dr. Morrison? And um, you know, specifically regarding the, uh, the the processing facilities, where there would be hundreds of people on a line that maybe on a good day might have two inches in between uh, in between each of them. Is it possible at all to even self uh, distance in those uh, conditions? So. In, as you mentioned, it is a, a federal uh, decision, and they. My understanding is that they are um, uh, receiving input from uh, different uh, lobster fishermen uh, associations, but. Um, I know from from my perspective that we would want to try to support um, with the, ed, uh, the best advice we can um, the fishers. Um, if they uh, go ahead and uh, whenever that uh, may be. And so we have been um, in conversation with uh, the Department uh, of Fisheries here in government, and um, I know they are working on uh, with our input uh, into guidance around um, 
uh, seafood processing plants, but also um, for on on vessels and on the wharf uh, and uh, all that uh, surrounds it. And so, it, uh, absolutely a challenge. And uh, so, I'll, I'll be interested to uh, see when um, when the season will go ahead. But what has that guidance been now for those processing plants? Um, well, it hasn't uh, gone out. Uh, I think there's certainly um, we're looking at information, and I know the Department of Fisheries is looking at information that has been uh, um, has been and is being developed in different parts of uh, the country uh, for the same area, and um, and we are in, in the process of reviewing it. And I have, um, you know. I've not been uh, approached formally by the uh, Fishermen's Association, but uh, um, we certainly have been in discussion with um, the Department of Fisheries. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. Rachel Collier, Eastern Graphic. Hello. I'm not sure who can best answer this first question. But um, Ontario has waived their three-month wait period for people to be covered by provincial health insurance. And by doing this, they've made sure that, for instance, migrant workers coming into the province or anyone who has been living abroad will be covered by the provincial system as soon as they arrive. And I'm wondering, is Health PEI considering waiving our three-month wait period? Oh, um, hi, Rachel. I'm, I'm not aware of any decision around that at this point. So... I'm sorry I can't answer your question, but it hasn't been something that's uh, come to me or my table that I'm aware of to have a decision on that. So you okay. may add something from the government side. Um, I'll just uh, uh, add that um, certainly at this point in time, if uh, anyone uh, who, for instance, needed a test to be done for COVID-19 or who is ill, um, those costs are, are certainly being covered uh, regardless of whether or not uh, someone has a, a health insurance uh, card here from Prince Edward Island. Okay, thanks. And yeah. then my second question is for you, Dr. Morrison, mm -hmm. and it's after the 14 days of self-isolation, do you know what kind of monitoring of housing and workplaces will be done by the provincial government to ensure that conditions are adequately addressing the needs of uh, folks working through the temporary foreign worker program uh, to make sure they are able to maintain physical distancing at home, on their way to work, and in the workplace? I'm thinking of uh, processing plants here. Uh, so um, there's two two parts of the answer. Um, so the first part is that there has been guidance uh, that uh, was just sent out this week um, for employers in the agriculture industry for temporary foreign workers. Um, that would uh, really go over in quite a bit of detail the expectations um, uh, for employers after that 14-day um, uh, period, and um, so and and there is a similar one going out uh, maybe today uh, that I, I looked at uh, last night. Uh, for the uh, employers of uh, temporary foreign workers in uh, seafood processing plants. So um, in terms of, uh, as you mentioned, accommodations. And then uh, the other part is, for instance, in the agricultural um, uh, sector, the housing would also have been uh, pre-inspected by our environmental health officers, and they're working through that process. Uh, we have not had any uh, large group of temporary foreign workers in the agriculture industry arrive yet, um, uh, so it's given us a, a few, a little bit of uh, extra time to uh, get that uh, arranged. Okay, and if a violation did occur, is there somewhere that uh, they could, that somebody could report these violations? Uh, so, if, uh, if someone is concerned about any uh, anything in terms of our. Um, self-isolation period, for instance, or concern um, uh, about, um, I guess, uh, the temporary foreign workers, they certainly, um, people have been calling the 1-800 line, uh, and uh, that is getting referred on to enforcement uh, if needed. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Radio-Canada. Bonjour, uh, Dr. Morrison. Bonjour. Uh, vous avez mentionné un peu plus tôt que vous êtes préoccupé par la consommation excessive d'alcool ou de drogue pendant la période de confinement. Je me demande sur, sur quelles données vous, vous 
basé pour, euh, pour euh, avoir ce genre de préoccupation-là. C'est, c'est pas... Euh, euh, c'est juste en général. Alors, je sais pas parce que j'ai entendu parler de, de plus de cas euh, en particulier, mais on sait que les... Euh, on, on a... Euh, euh, les personnes me, me racontent qu'il y en a beaucoup de personnes euh, euh, au, euh, au magasin d'alcool euh, et on sait qu'en général euh, partout au Canada on y parle euh, parce qu'on est chez nous euh, la plupart du temps on ne travaille pas et puis on est et c'est les choses comme euh, l'alcool et les autres euh, facteurs de risque qui augmentent des fois même la violence entre, entre familles et euh, alors, c'est juste un message en général. Euh, et puis, euh, je pense que c'est un... Euh, qu'on parle, même quand ce n'est pas pandémique, on sait qu'il y a des hauts niveaux, euh, des problèmes avec l'alcool à, à, pour un euh, instant ici à, à l'île du Prince-Édouard et euh, sans un pandémique. Alors, c'est quelque chose qu'on s'occupe... Euh, euh, quand c'est pas le temps de COVID, alors, euh, mais c'est, import, c'est important d'en mentionner euh, euh, à ce moment aussi. Quels sont les, les soutiens qu'on, qu'on pourrait retrouver pour des personnes qui ont euh, justement des problèmes d'alcool et, et ces problèmes-là sont amplifiés par la pandémie, par le fait qu'ils sont chez eux, qu'ils sont confinés? Quelles ressources est-ce qu'ils mm-hmm. peuvent euh, trouver? en cette période où on parle beaucoup, justement, de la pandémie, de la COVID-19. Euh, et puis, euh, je m'excuse parce que je pense que j'ai mentionné en anglais et puis j'ai pas, en français. Il y a des ressources avec euh, HealthPI, bien sûr. Et puis, il y a euh, un helpline euh, euh, de l'île du Prince-Édouard. Et c'est 1-800-218-2880. Et puis, il y a aussi euh, le courriel, euh, c'est pas un courriel, c'est un website. Euh, um, et je ne sais pas, euh, j'espère que c'est en français, mais je ne suis pas certaine. Mais c'est euh, princeedwardisland.ca slash COVID mental health. Et puis, euh, parce que ils ont, c'est, c'est un place pour commencer, mais je sais qu'il y en a d'autres ressources euh, qui sont sur le, le site web pour euh, indiquer les ressources pour les addictions et pour la santé euh, mentale. Merci. OK, merci. Um, I, I'll just translate the last question uh, that was in French uh, before we uh, finish. And it was really, a, was there a reason in particular I talked about uh, risk factors related to alcohol and, and drugs and uh, uh, smoking at this point in time? And it, it was really, in general, we know those are risk factors for our population and impact our uh, health of our population without a pandemic. And uh, we know they influence uh, our outcomes. And uh, so I think it's an important thing to mention uh, at any time um, because of the risks associated with it and uh, uh, our problem, our our use and misuse of alcohol, for instance, and our rates of smoking in this province, uh, even when it's non-pandemic time. So thank you all. I hope you have a a nice weekend and I'll be uh, back to uh, see you over the weekend if we have an increase in cases or anything changes. Thank you.